Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Frank. Uh, hi, Fred. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How's life over in Boston area? <laughs> well, we've had a summer that we'll remember. I can tell you that. Uh, it's been great for golfing. Uh, we haven't had a lot of rain. As a matter of fact, we've hardly had any rain. Wow. I, this year so far is going to be the uh, driest summer on record unless we get something that happens drastically in the next three weeks. But for the golfers, it's been great. The only thing that most of us in New England are concerned about is uh, that we don't get this precipitation in the form of snow in January and February. Because in this case, it'll never melt if they make up for it then. Oh, right. Well, don't have any rain over in the next week or so because I'm coming to town and going to an outdoor wedding. So just hold off on the rain for another week. Well, Labor Day weekend is supposed to be gorgeous. 70s, uh, not too humid, and another great golfing weekend. Uh, I wish I was bringing my sticks, but I'm not going to. But if I did, I'd stop by and have you make me some. How's that? <laughs> yeah, we could do that. That's, that's no problem at all. And they have a lot of customers that, that show up. Uh, they come in town on a business trip, and they'll be in on a Saturday. I'll do a fitting, and then they're going home in a week or 10 days, and they pick them up and take it home with them. So uh, all good. Very good. Do you have people coming in from all over the country um, or is mostly just locals? All, all over the country and uh, all over the world as well. There's a lot of people who take uh, business trips here. Uh, I've just had somebody in from the United Arab Emirates. He was a pilot. Uh, yeah, they come from everywhere. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and what is it that's, uh, that's bringing people into your shop? Well, what, one of the things that we do here is we do sell upscale equipment. Uh, I'm sure Jock has mentioned to you uh, the PXG brand, Miura brand, uh, and plus the fact we get components from a lot of the OEM manufacturers such as Callaway, TaylorMade, uh, TourEdge Exotics, uh, Mizuno. So we have high-end branding, and we're able to build those components from the ground up and fit them as well. Uh, we look at the PXG line as, as a very good model for, for selling, fitting and selling. All of our, our product that we fit with is actually a built club. In other words, it's bonded with the type of adhesive that we use. We don't use any type of mechanical connection to uh, bound a shaft and a head together. Uh, we feel that takes away from the feel of the club and when a person's buying a set of irons that start at 325, 350 an iron, they should really get to feel what that club actually feels like. And then also on a lot of our uh, components here is we build them in-house also. So a lot of these other companies that do the fitting, they will fax away an order, whether it's to Chicago or it's to Arizona, and they're built somewhere else, which if that's how their business model works, that's great. But I can tell you from my standpoint that customers come here, they're looking the guy in the eye who's fitting their clubs, and they're also looking at that same guy in the eye who's delivering and has built those clubs for them. So uh, that, that's a sense of security for the guy out there that's purchasing a set of clubs that are very expensive. So, you know, that's kind of been our business model. We're very happy with it. and We've done quite well with it. Interesting. What, tell me about your relationship with the manufacturers, because I always had the sense that the manufacturers are really focused on um, the one size fits all. Uh, you know, people, the beauty of having people walk into a big box store and buying right off the rack. Hey, my, my buddy's hitting one of these. I want one, too. And they never go through a fitting. They just, you know, it's just they, they swung it once. And they walk out with a new one. Um, is, but you have a relationship with manufacturers that sell components? That's, that's correct. Yeah, our, our biggest ones are uh, Parsons Extreme Golf, which I'll refer to from now on as PXG. Okay. Uh, Tour Edge Exotics. Uh, Callaway we do. TaylorMade we do as head products. Uh, Mizuno. And we have a couple of others there, too, that would be considered uh, other types of components, but not major components. I mean, we, we look at us as being in a very different marketplace where, you know, we can build from the ground up. And you're absolutely right from a fitting standpoint. Uh, it used to be that you'd go in, you'd buy a, 
a club off the rack or you try one, you go into a fitting booth and they'd have some type of simulator in there. And you'd hit a couple of balls. You'd grab a regular flex shaft or a stiff flex shaft uh, and say, well, gee, that feels good. Or the salesman that's standing there watching you hit golf balls. Yeah, that looks good and all that. But, you know, with the advent of the Internet today, the, the consumer out there is much smarter in regards to what he's looking for. Uh, true custom fitting. You guys come in and, you know, we put you on the launch monitor. We fit you to a golf ball. We have heads that we can exchange. I mean, on as far as wood shafts go, I probably have anywhere from 200 to 275 different combinations of wood shafts hanging on my wall. I, can, I need to stop you for a second. Sure. Wood shaft? Wood shaft, dry, driver, fairway wood. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. I thought you meant a wooden shaft. I, no, I no, no, no. Shaft no. for the woods. Okay, I apologize. Or as, they do, or as they do on the PGA, a lot of them call them metal woods now. But yeah. we still yeah. use the same terminology as a woodhead, driver, fairway wood, hybrid, considered wood, so to speak. Let, let's, let's pick up this concept. Um, I had a conversation with somebody in retail years ago about this, and I'm just curious how it would be approached from someone in your position who's a, a custom club maker, cl- custom club fitter. Guy walks in, he says, hey, my, bro- my buddy's hitting a new TaylorMade. I took a swing with it and hit it longer than I've ever hit. What do, you, do you tell him that buy it off your buddy or do you buy his club because no two clubs are ever alike or how? And, and, and of course he's going to go, well, no, it was, uh, I think it was 10 and a half degrees, but I don't know anything else beyond that. Well, first, if you gave me the name, right, that, that would be good. We could stop there, but you know, I, I get a lot of customers who come in and they'll say, yeah, I want to get fit to a set of Mayans. I don't think I really need a driver because I hit that well. Well, my first question is, well, what, you know, what typifies well? And I would ask <laughs> that same guy, I'll say, well, you hit it better than anything else, but it doesn't mean that you, you'll hit it better than anything that we can possibly fit you to. So if he had the opportunity to go get his buddy's driver or bring it with him to the fitting, we would stop there as a baseline or a benchmark, get some numbers off his buddy's driver and say, well, yeah, you hit that okay, but... You could use maybe another degree of loft on the driver head, maybe a knee ten and a half instead of nine and a half. And the shaft is, you know, a little bit too whippy, too flexible. You know, you're creating uh, higher spin numbers. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things that we could look at and say, hey, here's where you can improve. Okay, the head does fit you pretty good, but we have these other four or five heads that we should have you hit too. So, you know, we, we look at what the customer says, but... You know, we don't hear that much anymore, Fred. And, and the simple fact is because the advent of the Internet, the customer is much smarter. He knows where he wants to try to get to. He just may not know the direct path to get to point A to point B. So that's where our fitting philosophies come in. And, and we say, OK, here you go. Here's your buddy's driver. Here are the baseline numbers. Here's this Callaway driver that we fit you to. And you're, you know, you're another uh 10 or 15 yards longer, you're straighter, your spin numbers look better, your your launch angle numbers look better. This is the direction we should go in. And then people look at that as a, a real awakening, and, and they say, yeah, this really works. This is the way we should be doing this. Um, do manufacturers create components specifically for your trade that are different than what they put on their um – one, fits, one size fits all clubs? Well, the only thing that we really do differently is we have, uh, I would say, a greater abundance of shafts to fit through. The OEMs, they, they put out a nice variety of shafts. They, they put out the shafts that they call their stock option. A lot of the OEMs now have uh, upgradable shafts at no additional charge, which are nice for the customer. I would like to say is custom club fitters we have a bigger and better assortment of shafts that we can fit with. I mean, the OEMs, they make a lot of different heads. You know, they only add so many of those shafts and to their, to their fitting stable, I would call it. And we, we have, like I said, we have a better selection. Mm-hmm. And you can fine tune everything to every player. Right. You, you've got to have the right component. You know, in other words, you start with the head, and then you fit the shaft from there. You, you know, you fit the, the flex stiffness, uh, 
flex profile, uh, lower kick point shaft to get the ball up a little bit higher in the air. And, and, and all these numbers are extrapolated from our launch monitors that we use. And that's how we arrive at the best numbers. We try different heads, try different shafts. We try different club lengths. We try different grips, grip sizes, everything to make the customer more, more comfortable and feel better about swinging that specific club. Now, my last conversation that we had with uh, Jacques, who's also part of the, uh, the Club Fitters Guild dot org or the International Club Makers Guild, uh, which you were part of, and we'll talk more about that. Um, I, I kept uh, stopping him and saying, wait, please define that industry term. You're talking baseball here. I need to know as someone who's not you know, I don't spend a lot of time on clubs because once I get the clubs that I love and I'm playing with them, that's it. I'm going to stay with those. I'm not going to try to change them every couple of years. Uh, but you talked about a lower kick point. Yes. Can you please uh, explain that to me? Sure. A, a, a shaft, I mean, a, a shaft doesn't bend in sections, but it may have what we call a more active or softer tip as it mm -hmm. gets down towards the bottom of the shaft at the head end. And by that kicking through a little bit quicker through the release point of the golfer's swing, it'll, it'll, increase, it'll increase the ball spin a bit and will actually increase the launch angle of the ball coming off the driver face. I see. Um, I recently was uh, in with a club fitter and uh, was comparing a couple of six irons. All right. Um, and... So he put it up on his computer screen, and I grabbed a shot, and he's, like, throwing these numbers at me and explaining why this club is better than that club for me. Um, and he was going by so fast that I really had no idea what he was talking about. So if you don't mind, I'd love to get some feedback from you or from explanation from you of what exactly these terms mean and why they're relevant to me. Okay. Um, and so... Uh, let's start with, I'm going to just go over to the spin side, because that's the one I find the most confusing. Uh, this, this listed in RPMs, um, left or right, the side spin. Right. Okay, well, you just want to know what the, the, the definition yeah, what, what is. Yeah, well, that, what does that mean? Well, th there's... And there's what am I club, looking for? Okay, there, there's the club face that the, that's delivered to the ball, uh, whether it's from inside to a little bit outside, depends on the amount of spin you put on. Uh, there's axis spin, there's left spin, right spin, and, and that basically shapes the shot for you. In other words, the side spin. The lower the loft, you tend to have uh, too much error there, or there's too much room for error to develop too much side spin, whether it's to overdraw, power fade the ball. You have backspin, which is the number of backspin revolutions that are very important. Backspin, when, when we're fitting, we're, we're looking at ball speed, backspin numbers. Uh, and, and in that point, you know, everybody says today, well, I hit a driver, I need low, low spin. And, and that's not necessarily true. What, what you're looking at is for backspin numbers, uh, you're looking at ball speed as a prerequisite, and you're looking at launch angle. And from there, you're looking at a certain backspin numbers. And people say, well, okay, here is my backspin number. I'm at 3,500 or, or, or whatever it may be. And you say, well, that's a good number. Well, I went to this XYZ store and they told me off the driver, I need the lowest number possible. And I'll say, well, that's not true. And, and you know, I liken backspin and I explain it to my customers this way. Uh, they really understand it. And it's like a jet plane taken off a runway. Uh, you know, if a runway was five miles long, and the plane could get up to a 500 mile an hour ground speed or, or whatever it needed to get off the ground, it wouldn't be a problem. A runway is roughly a mile and a quarter long. So at a mile and a quarter long, you're looking at a takeoff speed of 220 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour. How does that plane get off, get off the ground? Well, it creates lift from its flaps on the plane, the air lawns, everything. And to create that drag and to create that lift to get the airplane up off the ground at 200 miles an hour, you're creating the turbulence under the wings, under the flaps. The backspin number is the same thing on a golf ball. How many times do you hear people say, well, I hit the ball out there. It looks like it goes 180 yards and it just falls out of the sky. 
And what happens is it's not creating enough spin, which in turn is creating the turbulence to keep the ball flying in the air. The ball gets out there, your ball speed is really low, and your backspin numbers are really low. There's no way to keep that ball in the air and to let it travel any amount of good distance that it should. And that's where uh, a club fitting comes in handy too, is we look at the backspin and not only do most of us ideally fit the driver in the driver shaft, we're also fitting a golf ball as well. Oh, well, there's the whole, that's a whole other conversation about fitting of the golf ball and, and selecting which is the right ball for you. But I want to, I want to not lose this, this part of the, the conversation about sure. spin. Um, so I was comparing two six irons. So I don't want to talk about drivers here. Okay. Just the, the, what I'm looking at here is, you can see, I have this picture that I took and it's like, uh, Trying to see this, you couldn't see those numbers, but um, for that six iron, and if I'm a right-handed golfer, um, on the side spin, am I looking for a higher number or a lower number, and am I looking for a right or a left spin? And I'm uh, on the average of the the five swings that I took with each club. Well, it, you know that that depends what your your natural shot is. I mean. I don't know if you, you take lessons or you have a pro that works with you. Some guys come in to me and they'll say, hey, you know what? Uh, my natural shot is a fade. My natural shot is a draw left to right. And, and, and that's it, the spin axis that you're looking at those numbers. And that number does vary greatly. I don't have them at the top of my head. I, uh, at some point in time, if you wanted a list of something, I could pull out. But, you know, that, that depends on, on the type of uh, swing that you have and how you move the ball left or right. Uh, as, as far as, uh, you know, spin numbers, uh, I had a great talk with uh, Kayla Maid's chief technical officer. Uh, his name is Benoit Vincent. We're, we're good friends. We, we talk a lot. And, you know, we, we generally, and, and, and this is something that came from him, and it's uh, a very, very good beginning number to look at. And this is kind of easy a lot of my customers can relate to it. And, you know, you're looking at spin numbers in the thousands of RPMs. And typically what I look for in a 5 iron would be like right around 5,000 RPMs, 6 iron, 6,000, so on and so forth. You get up to the 9 iron and pitching wedge, depending upon the type of club, the type of shaft in it. You know, you're upwards of eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 RPMs. And people think, well, geez, once I get up to the log wedge, I should be up around... 11 or 12,000. I say it just doesn't work that way. Hmm. Once you get into that nine to 10,000 RPMs and you start moving along in your wedges to your shorter wedges, you just don't see that kind of incremental grain. It does gain. It doesn't travel very much once you get into that nine or 10,000 range, but you're looking at a six iron depending on your swing and the side spin, but you're certainly looking for good launch angle. And I'm looking for spin in and around that 5,500, 6,000 RPM area. All right. So let me give you some of these numbers and what happened. My, my natural shot is a fade. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been trying to develop a draw. Um, it comes and goes <laughs> and depends, of course, on the club. But uh, uh, one club that I was hitting was a blade and it gave me uh, on the side spin, it gave me um, three with a right spin and two with a left spin. Um, so it broke down to an average of 16 right, and that was with the blade. Then with the cavity back, every one of them had right spin, um, but the average was 437 right. Okay, so, and, and again, do you, do, did he uh, send you a printout of what your club path looked like on that? No, I actually, I was just looking at the, these numbers and nobody was there with me. I was just using the computer myself. Um, uh, so, no, we didn't. Uh, I was uh, the ball that I was using, the cavity back. I was definitely and I have the uh, dispersion. Is it that uh, dispersion? Yeah, that's that's the uh, shot left and right at center. See, I would I, I, on, on your side spin numbers. I mean. One of the things that goes with that that I always print out for my customer is I'll print him out a picture of the club path, uh, what his face angle is at impact, whether it's open and closed, and, and that definitely impacts your right or your left-hand spin, mm -hmm. especially on your club path. 
So I wouldn't have to see that as a prerequisite. But if you're talking side spin numbers and you're talking when you said two, three, four, whatever it was, that's the RPMs or were you talking? No, the, uh, they're, they're, of the five swings that I took with the, uh, with the blade, um, three of them had right spin and two of them had left spin. Okay, so in how much though is there a total number there? You said well, there was an average number, right? Uh, yeah, there was an average number of sixteen right with the blade, but it Just, went all the way like it went from uh, a fourteen forty four right uh, to a seven right to a seven seventy left to a ten ninety five left. I mean, it was pretty much all over the place. Yeah, that that that's your club face being delivered, you know, through the path of the club, and then whatever your face angle is at impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that those are numbers that I would like to see to make better sense of that. But but that's <laughs> definitely how you're delivering the club face to the ball, and and it's definitely not the same on every shot. So Close, then with the oh. uh, yeah, so then with the with the uh, the cavity back six iron, I was um, everything was on the right. It had higher numbers on all of them, the lowest being 111 right, the highest being uh, 821 right, with an average of 437 right. Um, the backspin on those two clubs, on the averages, interesting, the backspin with the, the blade was 3980 and uh, 5819 with the cavity back. There you go. A, um, a much better club. Yeah, Boy. and then on the uh, total spin... Average uh, 4103 on the blade and 5842 on the cavity. Now, were they both shafted with the same shaft? Yes. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. Okay, so and I. Bo both both uh, club heads were manufactured by the same manufacturer. Okay, but one was a true blade and the other one was a cavity back. Correct. Okay, so you're looking at a blade for what I would deem a better player. And I, I do sell those. We do, do well with the PXG, the Torion versus the regular blade, which is a little bit oversized. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but in that cavity back, you get a lot of things going on there to help you. Uh, you have what's called club offset, where the hosel sits to where the face of the club is. It's a little farther forward. Helps you square that club up a little bit better in impact. You have perimeter weighting that is going to have, in, in most cases, a higher MOI, meaning resistance to off-center hits, resistance of twisting. So basically, just based on what you told me, uh, the blades, smaller sweet spot, uh, smaller head in general, less offset, that, that's you know not going to allow you, unless you're a real, real good player, it's not going to allow you to square up that club face as well through the impact zone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so of these numbers that it gives me on these comparisons of club head speed, ball speed, efficiency, launch angle, azimuth, side spin, back spin, total spin, peak height, descent angle, carry, total distance, and offline. Of those categories, which are the ones that, as the uninformed consumer, should I really be concerned or looking at to help me make a decision on which club to play? Well, I, I think you just answered your own question there, Fred. When you saw those backspin numbers that were closer to 6,000 on that thick yeah. iron, yeah. that was really good. Uh, your shot dispersion or tightness of the grouping, uh, that's what I look at here. The, the okay. shots were both the same, so uh, there, uh -huh. there's no differential there. The club okay. lengths were both the same. The, the club lengths? Yeah. I mean, yes. everything was identical. Yes. One was a blade and one was a cavity back. Yes. So yeah, uh, what, what you're looking at is your shot dispersion. You're looking Meaning at the, back the, uh, the when you say that where it's it's called here offline. Yes, that... offline. Yes, okay. left or right of center. Okay. You're looking for your tight grouping there. There should there's a page. I I use the flight scope launch monitor, and there's a page that uh, <clears throat> you know when when we fit for different clubs, we create a new category for every club. That way there what it does is it will show a circle or an oblong shape as to where all your balls are landing and it will show you how tight that group is. That's important. Uh, the, the launch angle being important. 
Uh, once you get the launch angle and the spin numbers right, and then you get, uh, I forget what you call it, I call it the apex of the ball flight, the highest point. Uh, that was called the peak height. Peak height. Uh, yeah. That's important for me, but not, not really, I, that's not something I really show the customer that, in other words, that's a relationship because, and, and just to get off base just a little bit, a lot of these clubs today are much stronger lofted than they used to be. Mm-hmm. And people say a lot of these clubs now, they're only getting the distance they're getting is because of a loft being strengthened. Well, a loft being strengthened is definitely going to give you higher ball speeds, but the way the club is designed, I mean, I, I had a guy in here two weeks ago. I won't say the name of the club. He said, well, my old clubs, they're, they're five degrees, you know, weaker. Of course, it's, yeah, I'm going to hit the other one longer. And I say, well, the technology today is going to show you that even though this other club is four degrees stronger lofted, I can get, I can bet you that we're going to look at it at an apex or the, or the peak height is even going to be higher than your old iron in which it was. So it, it, it's, it's a weak argument out there that people say, well, the only reason why clubs today are longer is because of the loft. On some cases it is, but on, on the real good manufacturers who put a lot of money into their R and D and design work. The, uh, the peak height is, is, is generally better than whatever someone comes in here with. Okay. Well, it looks like the cavity back is a, <laughs> based on what you're explaining to me. It's a much better. Uh, so um, there was a difference in the ball speed uh, on the averages. It was about five miles an hour faster with the, with the cavity back on the ball speed. Uh, the launch angles were pretty identical. Um, the peak height, there was a five, uh, five yard dif- difference. Five was, yards of five feet. Because that's uh, usually well, it's under, you can see. It says here yards. Peak oh, height, all right. Uh, it had, but I don't know, that seems awfully high. 26 yards with the cavity back and 21. Yeah, that's not feet. No, no, that's, that's, that's definitely yards. Yeah. So it had yeah. 26, 26 yards on the cavity back, 21 on the, on the blade. Okay. Uh, um, had the uh, descent angle had some difference to it. The carry had some difference, but the total distance were almost identical. Well, you hit that you hit that blade lower, so I suspect uh, the total distance you get a lot of run out on that six iron, and mm. that's not an iron that I look at here. It's a fitting iron that we use. Some of the OEMs now have gone to seven irons as far mm-hmm. as their fitting iron goes, but. You know, a six iron, you should be hitting at a flag, and that shouldn't be too far from stopping and dropping because a six iron you should get plenty of loft on it. And, you know, if you're going to bank on roll for a six iron, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So you don't want a lot of carry. No, you, I mean, you, you want, want a lot of carry. You don't want a lot on the total distance. You don't want a lot after that. I see. On okay. a six iron. Yeah. So on the I, I was getting 20 yards um uh, of when it released, I was getting 20 yards on, on the uh, blade and 12 on the cavity. Yeah, even 12's a lot for, for mm-hmm. a six iron. And, okay. and there again, there's different things there you could look at. Maybe the shaft wasn't quite perfect. Uh, you know, the, the, the launch angle. Do you have the launch angle there? Yeah, I do. Uh, launch angle, we're almost identical. The uh, blade was 18.2 degrees and the cavity back was 18.1 yeah see that that should be more of a dis- differential there as well i don't know what's going on there but you know that that blade is definitely uh a low lower type launching head mm-hmm. and and that's something i would look at is definitely launching lower than the cavity back so whatever went on there with your fitting i i mean the spin numbers were good the head was good uh, the shaft, and uh, I would have probably uh, taken around with that a little bit more. And at that point, too, would have introduced the ball to see exactly what went on there. But, yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of roll for a 6 iron cavity back or blade, I think. Okay. Then I guess the uh, really important one here would be offline. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So on the average of the offline for the blade, I was a minus 3, but it ranged from 3 to minus 44 and as high as plus 34. So well, and this is where you have to be careful. I mean, if you take 10 shots, you take a 10 shot matrix and, and all of a sudden you, you throw everything up on the screen to get the average as well. 
if you hit five yards, if you hit five shots, 33 yards left, and you hit five shots, 33 yards right, well, all of a sudden your average shot becomes dead center. Yeah, right. So that, that average doesn't tell you much of anything. Uh, you really should go in under that specific and related club and see what your deviation is left and uh, right or go to that shot screen page that shows you that oblong shape right. of where all your shots lie. That's, that's a, a, a much better view of seeing what's going on instead of just an average. Because like I said, there's guys that see shots and they say, wow, look sure. at that club. It's one yard left average. Well, yeah, if you go in and you look at every other <laughs> shot was right and every other shot was left and they were about the same. So, yeah, that's, all of a that's sudden you look like say they're playing. Feet. Right, that's what people saying they're playing military golf, right? Left, yeah. right, left, left, right. right, left, right. So, exactly. yeah, I mean, that shot dispersion is very important. And, and again, uh, it, it all comes in with the type of head that you get fit to, as well as the shaft, the club length, lie angle, and the whole nine yards that goes with it. Very yeah, so important. then I'm not looking. I'm not looking at average when I'm talking about the offline or the dispersion here. I really want to look at, at where the numbers are and the consistency of those numbers. Absolutely, distance okay. and left and right. So then, interestingly, on the uh, the cavity back, like I said, it, on on the five swings with the blade. Minus 44 plus 12, minus 22 plus 34 plus 3, right? So that was kind of left and right and left and right. Um, but with the cavity back, I was plus 1, plus 11, minus 3, minus 9, plus 6. There you go. Much tighter. That Much sounds tighter. like the club I should be hitting. Absolutely. Okay, good. All right, well, that's settled. <laughs> I'm glad I got that figured out now because I was looking at this going, I, there's a lot of numbers here and I really have no idea what I'm looking at. Yeah, it, it can be very overpowering when you first look at that. I mean, you go in there, you don't know what to expect for the first time. But when yeah. I do this with customers, we go through every step of the process and I'll just say, hey, this is where we are. This is what this is. This is what it should be in this ballpark. Is there anything that you don't understand or, or you're not sure about. But it, but in the end, once we get, like I said, from point A to point B, customers are, are, are quite happy. And, and to be honest with you, they really put it back in your hands as to, you know, Frank, I'm just in here. I'm going to swing the club the best I can. I'm, you know, working on my swing changes or whatever. Uh, I like them to get through that before they, they do anything as far as the club fitting goes. But a lot of times, you know, I'm refining my, I'm refining my swing and, you know, working on this, it's, it, it's, you know, it's something that people work on a lot. And there's just some guys, Hey, I'm 50 years old. My swing is what it is. I have no interest in taking lessons. I don't have any time, <laughs> Let, let's get me fit to at least something that, that fits me. And, and we'll just go from there. And when somebody walks in and you decide that, uh, the best thing to do would be create uh, a club for them with components that include the Mizuno heads, What's the price difference that I'm looking at between buying um, a set of Mizuno clubs out of the big box store versus having you um, make something that would be fine-tuned to me? Obviously, there's huge advantages, but I, what about cost difference? Well, and that's a great question, Fred. There, there's, there, first of all, you'd never go, want to go into a box store and just buy something off the rack. Absolutely. It just, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuances in, in, in club fitting, and I see very few people who come in with a standard set that it actually fits them. But real, real quick, um, what I'm able to do, I, I've, get, I've got people, all skill levels that come in. I get people in uh, uh, all different who want look at different price ranges. There's people, hey, Frank, I can't afford to spend a lot of money, but I really need to be custom fit. So what I can do is if I have to build something here, it's very expensive. But what I do offer my customers that, that don't want to spend that extra money for anything custom here is I'll use, let's say, Mizuno's uh, custom build department. That's very good. I'll fit the person. I, I have all the components here, all the different heads, all the different fitting shafts. And, and I'll do a fitting with the components that Mizuno has to offer. Again, the heads, the shafts, the grips. And I'll say, hey, here's where we are. Here's the Mizuno MP25. Uh, here's the shaft that, that, that fits you, uh, KBS, C-Taper Light, uh, Stiff Flex, uh, 
half inch on the standard length mid size grip. And then what I do is I'll take those dimensions, I'll fax them off to my uh, representative. He'll send them into Mizuno. They'll build that as a custom set. And the good part about it is they'll send it back to me. Now, being a club fitter and a builder, I, I check everything that comes back that's custom built from Mizuno, from TaylorMade, from Callaway. I check all the specs that I put in the sheet of the way I wanted those clubs built. So when they come back, I check them all out. And then I call my customer and say they're in. And at that point, that custom built set, other than what my fitting fee is, is the same price that you pay if you walk into a store and bought a set of irons off the shelf. That's huge. It's huge. If that's, if that's not an argument for everybody being custom fit, there is no argument. I, I agree because there's a lot of people that say to me, hey, I, I just can't afford to pay right. what you charge for, for custom fit, but can you help me? And I say, absolutely. I give them both options. I explain to them, Fred, what I just explained to you on how it's done and Customer says, well, that's great because if I bought them in a store, I don't think anybody would have the equipment to be able to check the specs that you spec me out for. And I said, that's 100%. And they, and they won't do it. I take those clubs in. I open the box, take all the, take all the labels off, and uh, just put them through a QC process where, hey, that's exactly what I spec out to Mizuno. This is what you have. These fit you. And it's the same price as a standard set in a store. Wow. Other than my fitting fee. Wow, that's incredible. Um, all right, let, let's spend a minute and a half or so uh, before we wrap this up talking about the International Club Makers Guild. Sure. Oh, where to start? I mean, that was spun off of a, uh, a, an older organization, and I want to say uh, about 2008, I think. You know, I don't have all my dates. The older you get, the, the less your memory works. But I want to say it was about... <laughs> 2008, uh, a bunch of guys felt that there was a need to be able to move on from an older organization that many guys belong to. Uh, it was an upstart. Uh, we went through some growing pains. We had a, a lot of old time fitters that were stuck in their ways and we had to evolve from that if we were going to do anything. And I, I will say with the advent of some newer technology, I mean, the internet came out, uh, typical launch monitors that, that came out that weren't readily available, like say in the, in the mid eighties, early nineties, they had some archaic type ones that work, but nothing like we have today in the Doppler radar system. Like we use, I use flight scope, Jock does other guys use track man. And, and, and those are invaluable tools into, into the plumb fitting business. So as that stuff became more technologically uh, evolved, it made a lot of guys' jobs a lot easier, moved into the electronics age with computers, uh, computer fitting software that works on those launch monitors. And we kind of grew with that type of business, the, the ICG. And then I really have to give a plug to our last two presidents, uh, Eddie Smith and uh, Jacques and Trier, who, who really moved this organization forward. Uh, with the idea of the uh, webinars that we do, uh, we, we do a lot of workshops. We do these, you know, these uh, global meetings that we have, the chapter meetings that we all get together, toss around ideas. So, you know, the, bi the biggest thing has been the computer technology and being able to talk to people overseas, how they join online with our group. We have a great resource library. So, you know, these guys had a vision and really took it to the next level. And, and, and that's how we've evolved from there. I, I don't know the exact numbers on membership, but our, our presence in Europe and in Asia is just simply phenomenal. Hmm. Our, our testing our certification uh, holds a lot of water with a lot of people. So that's, that's kind of how we evolved and, and we're just growing on a daily basis. You mentioned the resource library. Is that open to the public, or is that specifically for the club fitters, club makers? Uh, members only. Members uh, only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been one of the sticklers on that. Uh, you know, we we don't charge a lot of money for uh, our membership fee. Uh, we we encourage people of uh, all levels. We have hobbyists on there. We have part time guys on there. We have full time guys on there. But you, you know what, it, you, you really, some of those things, 
just, people just have to pay for is the bottom line. You know, you can't give away the ranch. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you're going to make people want to join. So what we do is, and this was Jacques' idea. It's a great idea on our homepage. You'll typically go on our homepage and you'll see one of our webinar series that we took like a five minute clip out of and put it on the homepage. People can see, you know, uh, a, a portion of that webinar and then, then it's like it, it gets cut off right in the middle. Hey, how about joining? See all of our webinars. And we'll also do the same with some clips from our resource library, which will, you know, I just did a 45 minute one and, and uh, it's in the resource library and all kinds of different things. And, you know, we're, I'm in the process now of doing, taking a couple of five minute, you know, bits and pieces out of those uh, videos from the resource library and be able to show somebody, kind of whet somebody's appetite or, yeah. you know, kind of try to drag them into, you know, hey, this is what we're all about. This is what we do. And we feel that we're the best, we're the best ones out there that do this kind of thing. And do you um, accept it as membership uh, club fitters? club repairmen who work in uh, big box stores or also in uh, pro shops, or are they all independent? No, no, we, we, we accept anybody who, I mean, like I said, we even have hobbyists who come on and want to mm. learn. Uh, you know, we, we've been very fortunate. There, there's a bunch of us who have what we call that hybrid model. Where we're able to take in those bigger OEM components and, you know, th this is something to throw back to the older club guys that never had this opportunity. I mean, this has been a fantastic of opportunity to uh, promote and sell tailor-made stuff, Callaway stuff, telling people, hey, I can build this from the ground up. Whereas before, all we had to work were some smaller component companies that, honestly, you had to spend a lot of time selling a customer, say, hey, X, Y, Z. And the customer says, well, I've, I've never heard of that. Well, it's because it's a component. It's 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 a good quality. It's a good forged club. But yeah, but I've never heard on it. Don't you know what can you do for me like Callaway TaylorMade? So this is where we are today. The club makers of today have a great opportunity out there to take their game to the next level, and, and that's what people want to see, and that's what they're buying. It's so interesting you say uh, how people say, "Well, I've never heard of that before." Well, that's obviously because. Either A, there's not a huge advertising budget behind it, or B, there's nobody on the tour playing with it. And it seems that so much of what um, amateur golfers are looking at for recommendations is what they're playing on the tour. And really, it's not relevant to their game, but if someone's playing a new white-headed driver, they're like, everyone's got to go out and get it, or a big fat grip on a putter, and everybody's got to go out and get it because they're seeing it on the tour or they're saying, oh, well, look, this commercial said that everybody's playing these balls. Well, and, and that's, that's a good point, but, I mean, if you, if you look at the drivers, I mean, mostly every company out there has two drivers. They have one for the masses. They have one for the better players. And, mm -hmm. and you see that same thing in irons as well. I, I think the day of, of any OEM just supplying one type of iron uh, and, and not a, a mix of them, I, I mean, there, you know, there, there's tour players out there that play this stuff, but make no mistake about it, the people who are paying the bills are the people who are golfing in the masses, and they, you know, I have a customer comes in and say, geez, I, I saw that new PSI tour head that Justin Rose was playing, and I'll say, well, yeah, I, there's the tour head. And here's the one that's a little bit bigger. Here's the PSI iron that, that you can play. And the same thing with the Callaway Apex. They have the Apex blades. You can take a look at the Apex cavity back or the new XROS cavity back. So, you know, I, I don't think it's so much model recognition as it is brand recognition that people see on TV. And, and that's the important part. Well, yeah, I have that, but it's kind of small and you know, here's where you are in our fitting process. You're a 20 handicap, 18 handicap. This is this is what we should look at for you in the TaylorMade, Callaway, Mizuno, Exotics models here, and and leave that other blade for the guy who's you know seven handicap, five handicap, whatever it may be. This is what we think you should be in, and and that's where the customer puts a lot of faith in our hands for that. You know, what 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 should I be playing? And the most important. Uh, saying that I like to tell a customer is, you know, you just, when you come in, you got to check your ego at the door. Uh, I mean, 
This is what you're here for. Hey, this, this is, is golf, man. For. This is this is golf, and and it's all you know, about ego. It, it, it is, but I said, you know, in the end, you're the customer. You'll do what's best for your game. But you know, you're here. You're paying me for my opinion and expertise. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think, and and they respect that. Sure, absolutely. So here's an opportunity. I'm going to step. I'm going to push this soapbox right up to you. Let you stand on it and make your pitch to. Uh, recruit new members to your guild? Well, I, I, I can tell you within, what is it, two weeks' time here? Actually, it, it's uh, I'm, I'm even losing track of dates here. Where are we at? The 30th today, uh, next Wednesday. 30th of now. August. This this can be heard in November. I mean, these are podcasts, okay. so, so give me specific 30, dates. Yeah, this is 2016. the 30th of August, 2016, uh, next Thursday, which uh, Wednesday, which is the 7th. I'll be on a plane over to Scotland for the first time to attend our uh, European chapter meeting over there. We're going to get a bunch of guys together. We're going to talk up the industry. Uh, we're going to have somebody there from uh, PXG, uh, the uh, one of the brands that, that I talked about in this podcast. We're going to have uh, people there from FlightScope who are going to talk about the launch monitors. I mean, we have people coming from all parts of the world to attend this chapter meeting. And to me, that speak volumes of the ICG, why people join, uh, the education that they get. They, they get to talk to all these, uh, you know, vendors. We have quite a few European guys that are interested in that PXG line. They're going to be able to come over and talk to the PXG sales guy who covers Europe and Asia. And he's one of the guys that has a, a high input of who do I open for an account over here? So we bring all these specialty products in their representatives to these area chapters. We offer uh, a ton of education, uh, certification, again, the uh, workshops and the resource libraries that are just chock full of different ways of doing things. We're very progressive. We, we as I like to say it, we're, we're we're not your grandfather's club making group. We're very <laughs> progressive. We'll, we'll take you to the next level every step of the way. We have a very active, uh, exciting forums that, that we have out there. We always have people that have been doing this a long time, replying to questions and answers and everything else. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I feel we're the premier club fitting group out there. And if, if you're interested in any level of the business, come and join. You'd be happy with it. And it sounds like not just people from all over the world, but you, it sounds like you have everybody from different parts of the industry coming in for conversation and, and uh, education as well. I, I, absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. we have our Hall of Fame members that, that we have. We have, uh, you know, we've had the president of Callaway Golf come and speak at our uh, get together at the uh, nice. Florida uh, PGA show, which is in January every year. I mean, we, we, we've really adapted and, and, you know, we, we thank these guys because they're all very busy and we really enjoy them coming aboard. And, and again, we do the webinar series where we have all these people online. We record the webinar series. So people in Europe or Asia, they don't have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> They, they can listen to it at the Elysia. So, yeah, we're very progressive. We're, we're very forward moving. And uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's a great organization to belong to. We're, we're videoing the, uh, the, the full three days that we're going to be in Scotland. So, you know, that'll whet some appetites as well, just being Absolutely. able to watch what goes on. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, this show is going to be published after you've already returned from <laughs> from St. Andrews. So, um, how was it? <laughs> how was the it's show? Great. <laughs> it, it's great. And you know what? And that's okay, too, because even if they see this, we're going to have the recording up on the website. Great. Uh, I'm not sure where that's going to be, but if they join, they can view the whole thing. And yeah, fast forward perfect. through most of it if they want. So, <laughs> it, it'll it'll be there, so... Hang in there and ready to watch. Oh, great. All right. Frank Viola, another one of the great club fitters in, in our in our world that we need to know more about. Um, and part of, again, to find them, they're clubfittersguild.org, and they are the International Club Makers Guild. 
Um, so don't confuse that. That will a link to that will be in the show notes from today's show, so that you can go and do more research on your own and hook up with these guys. Frank, so much, so much entertainment, and also, I really appreciate you helped me understand these numbers that I was, you know, painfully looking at and not having a clue of what was going on. Well, like I said, any, any, any good club fitter would sit there and, you know, it'd be easier for me if I was looking at them and I could, you know, without just you saying, but I mean, that's something that a, any good club fitter builder would sit there and say, here, here, here's what's going on here. This is why this is happening. And yeah, Fred, sorry to say, you got to be playing the cavity backs, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Frank. Hey, thank you for having me. Click on the link below to subscribe to our free weekly interviews on the Golf Smarter Podcast at golfsmarter.com.